Hello everyone. Um, my name is Vivek Srivastava. Uh, I work at Digital Asset as Technical Sales Director in London office. And uh, prior to Digital Asset, my background is uh, mostly in financial uh, industry. I worked in Citigroup for a long period of time, uh, and mostly in capital markets, technology, and uh, in between, I also worked with City Venture on our D10X program, uh, along with my own startup for a year in between uh, before joining DA. At DA, uh, I would say the primary role is to be the trusted advisor to the customer so that we can understand what are the kind of positive business outcomes they want to achieve and what uh, are the required capabilities they need uh, and whether, you know, where our technology works uh, or meets those requirements or not. Um, so in that, uh, is, uh, in that capacity, we work with uh, various customers uh, in, uh, in mostly in the EMEA region. That's Ian. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So Ian Woodgate, I'm a technical sales engineer at um, Digital Assets, similar to Vivek, I have a long history in, in IT and professional services. Um, I also ran my own startup for, for a number of years, um, and I'll be delivering the demo for today. Great. So um, as Digital Asset, we are a software uh, company that uh, works with uh, financial industry, uh, basically enterprise clients mostly uh, in financial industry as well as in other industries, primarily to build multi-party applications uh, as, and networks where, and drive uh, economic value to them. Uh, at the heart of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, in terms of the, the company, we are in six countries. We grew around 75% in the last two years. Um, a lot of our uh, focus and our experience comes from finance, financial industry as well as uh, core, tech, uh, core technical uh, folks that we have uh, in the company. We are we very much focus on diversity and we are hiring. So uh, you can uh, <laughs> go to the career page and uh, look for the roles that we have. Uh, I mean, these are some of our clients. Uh, many of them are in production uh, or some of them are in uh, getting to production. Uh, most of the clients, I would say, they are, we have, they are in enterprise space, uh, financial, institutions like, like exchanges, banks, um, but also we work with insurance companies uh, as well as in healthcare and uh, many of our customers uh, focus on the ESG goals as well. So it's a, it's a variety of uh, customers we work with. In terms of uh, to make, uh, you know, that they, our customers uh, reach their goal, you know, what, the, you know, what business uh, outcomes they want to achieve, uh, at the core of our technology, Next slide. Uh, we have two uh, primary uh, innovations. Uh, I would say Daml language and Canton Ledger. So Daml is a smart open source smart contract language, uh, which is primarily our uh, customers use to define the schema, the semantics, and the execution of the transactions. Uh, it's a purpose built uh, uh, language that is built on the building blocks of rights and obligations. Uh, so privacy comes first. Uh, you do not, as a, as a developer, you do not need to do anything outside the box to make sure that the privacy is uh, ensured and it uh, gets uh, enforced uh, in a distributed uh, manner as well. So uh, in terms of the, the other innovation, which is Kant and the ledger, so that's, again, is the privacy-enabled distributed ledger, which works with uh, complementary blockchains like Fabric, Hyperledger Fabric, and Hyperledger Basu, uh, but also you, it depends on our customers' uh, needs. If you know if their trust assumption is centralized trust, uh, where you still have a distributed applications, but uh, all the entities they can trust one single entity, you can have basically uh, your distributed ledger running uh, with with uh, one uh, essentially. Uh, the domain operator, which could be running on database. So that way, what you can actually do is you can create networks where you can um, fulfill the requirements, where you have either the centralized trust requirements or a decentralized trust. And our vision is to create this global economic network of these kind of networks so that where you can easily connect to any of these networks and start doing business uh, you know, with other participants and the same way like internet works today. So for example, uh, to connect to the internet and do business on internet, you need really two main things. One is your browser, right? And then your ISP. And that way you can then either launch new businesses or 
uh, interact with other businesses. And that's our vision, that as far as you have a daml node, which like works like the internet browser, so to say, in the daml network, uh, and uh, you can basically connect to any of the domains which are provided by you know, various other customers, uh, and then you can do transactions with you know, various other entities on this uh, global economic network. Next slide, please. So in today's uh, demo, what we're going to focus on is around asset tokenization. And when we worked with our customers, uh, I would say a lot of our, our customers had similar uh, building blocks that they need to do, they needed to do, uh, to basically whether that's issuance of the uh, tokenization, issuance of the asset, life cycling of the asset, uh, distribution, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, another innovation what we have done is uh, where we, we, we build this demo finance library, uh, which is open source, uh, but that essentially, I would say, if you look at uh, the stack here, you know, at, uh, so at the very bottom, you have the infrastructure, which is like the, whichever the underlying blockchain uh, you want to use. But then uh, in terms of once you have your, when you're building your application, the demo finance library provides you those building blocks so that all of our clients do not need to rebuild them, right? So like the asset definition, the accounts, transfers, DVPs, and so on and so forth. And then we work with uh, our customers, which is, again, there are certain reusable components here as well, like when it comes to asset issuance, distribution, and so on and so forth. So the intent is that 80% of the work, which is, uh, I would say, uh, standard or can be reusable, uh, so that essentially we work with our customers and that's open source. Our customers then can customize that to add that 20% which is uh, their uh, IP essentially, right? And they can build these complex uh, financial applications which are multi-party uh, very quickly, very easily. So that helps our customers go from basically whenever they want to start to live very, very quickly. So at DA, we focus a lot more on productivity uh, and time to market. And if you look at DAML as a language, our SDK, the toolkit, uh, and all the toolings that comes along with, uh, with our tech stack is mostly focused on, you want to build a secure private uh, network where you can have these multi-party distributed applications that you can build but you don't need to put too many resources or you don't need to wait for a year to build these and go live, right? You can actually, we have our customers who can, who have done that actually, that they started with a very simple use case in three months time, they put their pilot in production, and then from there onwards, it's an incremental growth. So they start to build incrementally on top of that because when you build using Daniel Tech Stack, uh, you, your, your applications are composable and your network is composable as well. So uh, on that note, I'll finish talking and will not bore you with the slides anymore. I'll hand it over to Ian to actually do the live demo. Just a bit of a context on the demo. The, it is running on, on his machine uh, using Daml, Canton, um, on the Hyperledger fabric. So every, you'll see the code, you'll see the, 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 the demo as well as some of the uh, things under the hood, like the blocks uh, uh, being created and so on and so forth. Thanks very much, Vivek. And, and just before we get started, just interested to see a quick show of hands. Who here has heard of Digital Asset before you came today? Okay. And also, so we pitch it right, who here would say they are technical as opposed to business? Okay, so we've got a fairly even split between tech and business. So we'll, tr we'll try to keep everyone happy then. So as Vivek says, we're going to show um, some, some example of this demo solution that we've built today to show tokenization. And, and in particular, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to it. So I'm just going to show a subset. We're going to show how we actually uh, create a structure for, for financial assets and, and how, the, how we can build them dynamically and, and use them. Then we're going to go through a process of, of actually issuing them um, in, in a kind of Dutch auction. So I want to start off with by just showing you how, how, we, how we structure assets. Um, so if I click into here, you can see I'm logged in as, as a fictitious issuer up here. I've got some pre-created pre assets here. And just to give you an understanding of, of how, how this works in, in our model, um, if we go and look at one, so I'm going to go and look at a, a forward, okay? So um, this one here, uh, big one, this one here. 
Um, so this is a, a, a kind of uh, asset which is an agreement basically to, to purchase a particular stock at a particular date in the future. And the way we represent this is, is with this kind of tree structure, what we call a tree of claims, which says on, on a particular date, two things are going to happen. I'm going to give, in this case, 20 Tesla stock, and I'm going to receive um, 10,000 US dollars, okay? So it turns out this is a very good tree structure for modeling any kind of asset. So the, the beauty of this approach is, is we, can, we can model all of our assets using this, this kind of approach, and then all the, all the steps that we want to take them through, so from issuance to distribution to um, life cycling and trading, we can write, write all of that code once and use it regardless of the kind of instrument that we're working with, whether it's a, a stock or a derivative or a future or, or a bond or anything. We, we just have to write that, that code once. Okay. Uh, in the bottom here, I've got uh, the Hyperledger Explorer, and we can just uh, see as, as we progress, you'll see as we go through the demo, the block count going up. That's really just to show you that it really is running on Hyperledger fabric, okay, uh, and it's not smoke and mirrors. So what we're going to do for the next part of the demo is we're going to create a new, uh, a new kind of asset. We're going to create a new bond, okay? And I'm going to create a floating rate bond. So we'll give our bond a name. While, uh, Ian, sorry. While Ian is uh, filling up the uh, fields for bond creation, the key thing is that uh, when, you'll, when the bond is created, uh, you'll see that we'll use the same tree structure. So from, and essentially behind the GUI, actually the assets in smart contracts are represented in that tree structure as well. So the, the UI is just a representation on the, the presentation here. Um, but the key thing is that once you define, so you can think of basically when you have to define a different asset, it's just a different shape of the tree, right? So you can actually define a new shape of the tree, so a new asset uh, on the fly, which is very powerful because today, if, we, if a bank has to uh, implement a new asset class. It's a new release. It takes a couple of months. Here, you can actually do it fairly quickly. Now, uh, the other thing is that once you define the tree structure, uh, you can define some of those common functions that can be applied on this tree structure. So like life cycling uh, uh, and um, corporate actions and so on and so forth. And that's where you will start to see the value because for different asset classes, you don't have to redefine everything and different assets, you don't have to define, redefine those, those common functions. And you, you need to, you start to reuse a lot of them. And that's where the productivity comes that you can actually, you know, create a new asset and launch it very, very quickly. Thanks, Vivek. And, and this looks more complex, but really it's not. It's just a, re a, a rep rep repetition of the branches in the tree. And if you zoom into each branch, it's basically the coupon payments that you get on a bond. So you can see at a particular date, I'm going to look up the rate of the USD Live, a six-month rate, and, and pay out that amount right until my last payment, which is my final um, redemption date when the bond expires, and I pay back the original dollar that the bond cost. Okay, so. Different, different kind of instrument, but, but using the same principle to, to structure it, as Vivek says. So now that we've got that, what we can do next is we can go ahead and, and actually issue that. So I can go into this issuance page here. We're going to do a new issuance. I'm going to issue that asset that we've just created. And let's say I'm going to issue a million of them. And we're, we're not showing all the detailed workflow processes that you might have here around this might go to registry or compliance or whatever. We're just showing the, the boundary of that. Um, that's created that bond. So if I go ahead now and look at what I'm holding, you can see here that I've got a thousand, a million of these. Let's go ahead now and create a, a Dutch auction for them. So we can go into here and go to distribution. I'll create a new distribution, a new auction. So while Ian is doing that, uh, again, when I mentioned that privacy is built in, uh, what you'll see if, you know, once you look at the code is that as the Dutch auction or the asset ownership or how the bits are, are basically the mechanism to place a bid is coded in a smart contract, uh, after once those business rules are written, uh, as a, you don't need to do anything additional to make sure that the privacy is actually enforced throughout the tech stack you know, all the way to when, when you receive on your node the data and no one else should be, uh, other than the stakeholders, they sh no one else should be able to get the data and see the data, right? Uh, and that's essentially I would, is one of the unique thing about Daml in Canton is that 
uh, it's about privacy and data minimization. So uh, in other uh, platform, you have to write a lot more code to achieve that versus it, because DAML, the way it is built, it, it happens for free for you, to you, essentially. You don't need to worry about it. Okay, so I've now switched screens and I'm logged in as, as an investor called Alice. She's going to bid for 800,000 of our bonds at a price of 0 0.98 dollars. Okay, and similarly at the bottom here, I'm going to place a bid as Bob, another investor. And let's say he goes and bids uh, for 400,000 at a price of 0 0.975. Okay, and now we're going to see a different view because what I'm going to do at the top is log in as the an agent, so the person who's running the uh, running the auction. They can go into the the, the auction here, and they stay there able with their permissions. Um, they're able to see all the bids that have been made. And you can see we're slightly oversubscribed here at 120% because we've got in at 800 and 400,000 of each. What I will do at the bottom is I'm going to just show you Bob's holdings, what his current custody. <coughs> you can see he's just got US dollars in his account at the moment. Now, when we close this auction as the agent, what we should see is that it will fill these orders according to our Dutch auction rules. And this is happening completely atomically. So everything's trading and settling at once in one atomic transaction. And you can see now that Bob has got his, he's had a partially filled order because he was, uh, he got 200,000 and Alice in fact got the her full 800,000 um, and, and that, that has, those trades have completed atomically. So the last bit to uh, add here what uh, Ian was saying about atomic transaction. So in this transaction when you uh, close the auction, you think what happened was that there were two DVPs essentially, right? Because there were two allocations of bond and all that happened in as atomic transaction and with the privacy and not just like uh, privacy, but sub-transaction privacy, which is quite unique to DAML, where even if you have multiple sub-transaction and say transaction one is only meant to basically between two different stakeholders versus sub-transaction two is between some other stakeholders, you can actually enforce that sub-transaction level privacy using DAML. You, and again, you don't need to do anything out of the box. As far as your business rules are written that way, uh, you know, it comes out of the box. So that's quite uh, unique. So uh, in the slide where you had, uh, when you created the asset, you showed the, uh, the tree right after that. Yep. So that was the smart contract that you had created, which basically replicated automatically uh, for the term of the bond. So no, the smart. So what we have done is the smart contract for bond or for DVP, right? They have been created in that financial, like using that financial library, right? right. And this was just basically using that to create. But if you do want to create a new instrument, you can actually, we do have an interface where you just have to create a new tree structure, right? right so, and that you can do it on the fly as well. Yeah. So you can actually create new uh, instruments on the fly too. If you want to, yeah, I won't go through it all now, but you do have the option to go in here and do custom instrument and you can actually then dynamically start building out your, um, building out a tree like this if you want to. Very good question. So Alice might not have access to Fabric Ledger. So, so it depends on the. Has. So yeah. let's say let's say she has it. Uh, what it's all all the business data is encrypted. So no one, uh, not even the operator. So the peop, anyone who has the node, they they will they will, they can access the underlying data. So only the part spent node where the parties are hosted, they are the only one who can uh, decrypt the data and then make it available to the party they are hosting. How do you prevent double spend? So double, okay, very good question. So in terms of the the double spend is uh, the stopped at the demo level itself so that when you, when you receive basically the, the transactions that are, they are double uh, committed, so essentially between Alice and Bob, uh, they both have to pre-verify that this is the this is the transaction. These are the state, and when they both verify, then only the transaction is successful. The fab at the fabric level, what gets stored is basically the ordering of the transaction, and then the payload. But the payload is encrypted, yeah. essentially. Under Alice and Bob's scheme. Second. 
No, the parchment notes. Uh, so again, the notes. So it depends if Alice has the note, then yes, of course. Uh, but uh, it depends on the use cases because not every time you will have all the parties having the fabric node. So you can confirm that you don't, you are not using any zero nodes? No, no, no. Right, no. no. And how can you deal with cache lag when the cache uh, lag is on the other network one? Uh, because you said it's atomic EVP and it requires cache to register the cache at the same ledger as uh, the other. Be very good question. So we are talking about the cross domain transactions, right? So the way, uh, so far, there's a there's a uh, precondition essentially that if you want to do a cross-domain transaction, then you, the entities basically need the or the, the department nodes need to have one common uh, connection to one common domain essentially, because you need the order, like sequence, the ordering of the transactions. So uh, that's the only uh, uh, requirement. As far as you have one common domain, you can actually do a cross-domain atomic transaction. Then you'd need some kind of interrupt. It doesn't solution. matter that we are so. Sorry. Then you'd need some kind of interrupt solution. So, you, so let's finish your question first. Sorry. Because so, well, I, wonder, I was wondering if the cache ledger is uh, on a, a public uh, network. Right. So at that point, if if that's the case, then you will need some kind of an asset bridge, where you if you if if you're not using Daml, net, Daml and Canton network, and you're interacting with outside that network to a public network or any other network with a native uh, asset, then you will need an asset bridge and you have you can use the, uh, the hash lock time uh, 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 kind of technologies. Yeah. Yeah. How is the latency when you start getting big? Uh, do you see like, you know, when the ordering starts getting processed, is there any latency that you're... So again, a lot of it depends on the use case and how things are deployed. We have customers uh, who are uh, basically using it for uh, live betting so, I mean, you can, I mean, all of our tech stack can be horizontally scaled. So you can receive the throughput. Yes, there will be certain latency because you cannot, there's no, in technology, there's no free lunch. So if you want to receive the guarantee that you, that you want, there will be certain latency. But again, uh, it, it doesn't, once you are happy with that latency in your critical path, then you can use sharding or other kind of mechanism to do horizontal scaling uh, to uh, achieve your throughput requirements. I think probably, if there's any more questions, perhaps we'll take them offline. Yeah. Come, uh, come we, and see we us at our stand. We have, we have uh, um, our booth upstairs, so come over. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone.